Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Super excited to have you here. Super excited to, to have Rand Fishkin on board. Um, so yeah, we are going to be learning a lot tonight. And obviously, you're going to be tweeting about the things you're learning. So if you do, please hashtag MinSearch and at MinSearch so we can uh, like the crap out of your comments and give you some more, uh, more reach. Um, and if you ever have any questions, comments, just board at MinSearch.org and we will point you in the right direction and comment at you right there. Want to say huge thank you to our sponsors. So I don't know if y'all noticed, but you got in here for zero dollars and zero cents. That's right. It is free of charge um, to join all of our virtual events. Um, so huge thank you to our virtual event sponsors, Rocket 55 and Blue Key Media, who made that happen for us. Thank you very much. Um, also, huge shout out to our other sponsors, Hook Agency, Click360, Nordic Click, Rank Crankers. If any of you are here from these companies, throw it in the chat, hype yourselves up a little bit. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, but there's there's some more white space here. So if your business is interested in sponsoring MinSearch, um, get in contact with Jason Sem or just board at MinSearch.org and we'll point you in the right direction. So speaking of making these events free, there are also some people here that uh, help out free of charge. We are all a volunteer-based board. Um, so everyone on here is a member of our board of directors uh, working hard to make these events um, good for you. So, and you may notice there is one question mark over a face. We are in the midst of uh, interviewing diversity directors. So next month, you will see, uh, see some more details on there. I don't think there will be a, a question mark anymore. So exciting stuff to come. All right, let's talk uh, real quick here about membership. So even though these events are free of charge, um, MinSearch still would really love your support. Um, an individual membership is $125 a year. That's just, what is that, like $10 a month. Um, so yeah, it just helps support MinSearch and keep us going and offers you a cool discount on the summit. We are also starting to roll out some new sliding scale options. Um, more details on that to come. And speaking of the summit, we, uh, we, we, we dug up this picture from the archives. This is back in, I think, 2014 when Rand spoke at the MinSearch summit feels like a million years ago since we were all in person. But um, yes, yeah, so this year, location's a little bit different. We're gonna be moving all online. So it'll be in June, keep your eye out. More details are coming on this very soon. So get excited. And speaking of details, these details will be on our website, which we are currently working on. We have a new site in the works. We've been, we've been keeping ourselves pretty busy lately. Um, so yes, we will definitely let you know when the new site is up and deepest apologies, for those of you, if you've had any trouble on our current site, we are, we are working on it. All right, that's all the announcements I had. Now for the reason you're really here, Rand Fishkin is in the virtual house. Round of virtual applause, please. Um, and Rand is gonna be talking to us about algorithms and incentives, the secret forces that shape marketing in 2021. And with that, Rand, it's gotta turn it over to you. Wonderful, all right, thanks so much, Abby. Uh, let's make sure that you all can see my screen effectively, which means I should close all these things. All right, and if I share, okay. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? I think it's in non-presentation mode. I'm gonna put it in presentation mode and keep my fingers crossed that it fires up. We all see, right, can you can see it full screen thing. now? GameStop yeah. stock purchase confirmation. <laughs> No, 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 no. It is a presentation. Just kidding. <laughs> I own no public company stock because um, I kind of think it's a rigged game. But anyway, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, actually, potentially relevant to some of the things we'll be talking about today. So I have um, a whole ton and, and uh, Josh, Abby, everyone from MinSearch, uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's great to be back virtually. I I, I miss my trips to Minnesota, but hopefully uh, 2022, I don't know, probably, probably we'll, we'll get together in person. So uh, let's, let's chat through some of these secret forces uh, behind the web and how they impact so much of our thinking. So here's my general view, right? I think um, generally speaking that the, the last few years, the golden age, what, what will probably be referred to over the next 
couple decades of the golden age of digital marketing has ended. And that's not necessarily a terrible thing, right? But from, 20, from 2001 to 2015, um, a lot of things were true. And, and I think those of you who've been around digital marketing for uh, five to 20 years will, will probably recognize this, right? That internet adoption essentially was growing so fast across so many countries that even big tech companies who needed you know, to show Wall Street massive growth or their venture investors massive growth, they didn't really need to deviate from their core value proposition. They could, they could just do the things that they were really good at and get so much growth that they didn't have to do anything else. Um, the ability of marketers to be able to track data, I know we were complaining about this in the uh, Q&A right before this, um, that tracking keywords, tracking referrals, tracking cookies, made digital marketing really easy to justify, even though we had to sell a lot of people who didn't believe in digital yet, especially in that, that first decade of the 2000s, uh, it was eminently provable. And in most sectors, you only had a few players who were savvy enough to invest. So competition was a lot lighter in most sectors than it is today. The last five years, all of this has changed, and I apologize for a bullet wall of text. I, I won't do this again, but uh, just you know, <laughs> off the top of my head, Google nixed all keyword organic keyword data. Uh, big tech has been obfuscating tons of referral data, and so there's this huge rise in dark traffic. Google started competing with tons of publishers and industries, putting their own products above everyone else's. Everyone, even even laggards, started getting into digital marketing, especially. I mean. Anybody who wasn't there, you know, last year is now because of COVID. Uh, the social algorithms, the the uh, the ones that are behind the scenes that run everything we see on Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, etc., they have biased to keep content and users on their sites, right? That because that that's how they get growth. And through monopoly power, through government lobbying, through thousands of acquisitions. There's basically five tech giants that control 80 plus percent of all web traffic. Um, and if you're, if you're worried about that, so am I. So what's, what's next? What do we do as marketers? How do we respond to this? Um, I, I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is like keeping up with everything that's impacting the digital landscape. It is absolutely exhausting and unrealistic for a marketer to do their job and also understand everything that's going on in the digital landscape. If you if you try and keep up by reading things like you know Hacker News and Tech Meme and the the subreddits and even just marketing Twitter and SEO Twitter every day, it's it's overwhelming, right? It's okay, yes, I, I right this big trend around Google answering more searches and. Oh yeah, they're right. Last September, they removed a bunch of keyword data. How's that going? Oh, it's gotten worse even since then. And what is what do those reports look like? Which data are they taking from us? And oh, what a, right there. There's a bunch more like ad relevance issues, and there's this weird stuff happening in Google Display Network, and they're they're trying to force advertisers to bid on these navigational searches, and they have this new lead capture form that keeps you on the site, and they're probably going to bias to those over time, and. Oh, right. Google's planning to kill all the third party referrals because of that like weird privacy deal between Firefox and Apple and Google. But even the, but there's some fighting about it and like what's going on with that. And what is this? What is this federated lists of cohorts flock that, that Google's coming out with, right? That's supposedly going to replace the cookie tracking. That's that's its own nightmare. I don't know if you've read uh, Shoshana Wodinsky, by the way, is a, is a great writer on this uh, stuff. It's her job to keep up with it. And even she says regularly, uh, this crap is impossible to keep up with. It's just so overwhelming. Uh, Facebook, right? Facebook has done this, this big linking effort between WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and Instagram, not out of convenience for users, but like to make antitrust efforts to break it up much more difficult and keeping on top of how that interfaces with the um, the marketing ads that you might run or the platform interaction between them, it's super challenging. They, they change up a ton of how advertising works all the time on Facebook's platform, what you can track, what you can engage with, which, um, which interest groups you can select to advertise against. Some pages you can, many pages you can't, some interests you can, many you can't. There's all this 
weird stuff around like what is um, a, a brand safety, which is essentially like removing your content um, and your advertising from places that potentially are, are I don't know, um, sharing news sources that might not be positive versus actual conspiracy, disinformation, hate speech content, right? And the platforms have a totally misaligned um, incentive model than what we have, right? We, we have goals around like what's good for our businesses and what's good for society. And Facebook has goals around engagement for amplification and ad revenue from susceptible users. And um, yeah, they, they, they have had some serious problems here. Uh, and simultaneously to all of this, the, Facebook's been dropping organic reach. I don't know if you remember, like a few years ago, I, I think when I spoke at MN Search in Sorry, I still call it MN Search. Min Search uh, in 2014, um, I believe I showed a graphic of how Facebook average page engagement had dropped from like 11% to four or five percent, and today it's it's 0.09 percent. Oy vey, uh, right? And that's because they want to keep people on Facebook, and they want to prevent any of these upstarts that over the last few years have have basically used Facebook engagement to build their businesses. You know, there was Farmville way back in the day, and then BuzzFeed in sort of the 2014 to 16 era. And and they're not alone. Like Amazon is doing all sorts of sketchy things in e-commerce world, right? To try and discourage anyone else from building up. Uh, using their profits that they make off of Amazon Marketplace to build substantial competition and leverage the market dominance that they've got. And then they, you know, they deny they do things like this, but but there's plenty of reports showing that they do, right? That essentially they scoop up the data from all the businesses that build uh, products on their platform and then, you know, prevent brands from building customer loyalty off of that and drive down prices initially until they know people are defaulting to Amazon and then they take complete control of the supply chain and drive up prices. So, you know, 10 years ago, Amazon used to be the cheapest place for everything. Now it's the cheapest place for some things, but often more expensive than other places. And, and we just don't realize it because we're all prime members and we buy from it anyway. I feel like playing whack-a-mole with this constant deluge and being like, okay, here's what's going on in this ecosystem. Let me try and understand what's uh, happening. Let me read about it. Let me try and uh, interpret the news and then synthesize that into my own business and figure out how that applies to all the tactics and channels we're using. <sighs> Unsustainable. And, and not, um, not plausible or reasonable for any digital marketing team to keep track of. And so we need to stay as, uh, on top of this and I think the only way to do that is by trying to get to the root causes of our environment. So rather than keeping up with each individual change, we understand what are the driving forces, the incentives, the algorithms behind uh, these platforms that, that really own and control so much of the web's distribution and traffic. And then we can play to the long term with our strategies and tactics. So, if that didn't quite make sense in, in uh, text speak, let me try and visualize it for you. There's some, there some great visualizations of systems thinking, right? It's this idea of like, there's all these disconnected points, like Facebook does this, Amazon does that, Google does that, blah, 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 blah. And we're trying to connect them all. We're trying to understand how they're connected and why they're connected. So when new ones pop up, we have our interconnected model in our head. We don't have to just play whack-a-mole with the, the dots. And it's the same thing between we analyze each change independently to we sort of synthesize in our heads, oh, right, this new thing is just a continuation of the same pattern that's been going on for a long time, right? I, you know, GDPR and Flock are basically two um, birds of the same feather, right? It's around big tech lobbying and using privacy as an excuse to further their monopoly power in the space and own more of it. And I get how that's gonna work and I get what it's gonna do. So <laughs> in order to help with this, I am now going to attempt to squish 70, minutes, uh, 70 years of economic history into five minutes. Are you ready? I gotta get my tapping fingers ready here. All right, 
It's essentially the story of how capitalists, um, those with lots of capital, came to prefer growth over profit. So let's go back to 1950. There's this great visualization on the New York Times. It's, it's interactive. You can play with the chart here. And when US taxation was surprisingly progressive, like right? essentially the more you made, the more you paid in taxes. But even then, uh, a lot of wealthy families and businesses got around this through all sorts of tax loopholes and, and whatever, bribing Congress members to create little subsidies for their specific thing that they were doing. Over time, over essentially the next 20 years from the 50s to the 70s, uh, all these wealthy individuals and companies used money and influence to bring their taxes down while, while their profits soared, right? So you can see this in all these, you know, anytime you look at like an income inequality chart or macroeconomic chart, regardless, right? Um, essentially, it's this is not just true in the United States, it's true across the, the Western world. And, you know, you see income tax receipts for corporations go down even as profits are, are rising. Um, and this happens, you know, pretty, pretty obviously over the last uh, 50, 60 years. And at the same time, you get this big gap emerging between productivity and growth and hourly compensation. So if you um, have read in any, anytime I see one of those memes about how, whatever it is, uh, millennials or Generation Z is, you know, frustrated with whatever boomers because, uh, you know, they're, they're like, well, why don't you pay your way through college? Obviously, that's completely impossible for the last 20 years. But um, you can see why that is, because essentially, as productivity has continued to grow massively in the United States at pretty much the same rate it did um, since, since 1950, compensation has not kept up uh, nearly at all. And and so you get this gap between rich and poor, which is, of course, a catalyst for, for political strife. But you get that's why you get this inequality system, right? Essentially, lots of people making lots more money off the labor of people who are not making more money. And what do they do? They tax, they lobbied uh, to get the taxes sort of reduced. And so you can see, um, I don't want to blame any particular political party. I think both are reasonably responsible for not. Um, you know, for not solving these problems in, in thoughtful ways. But uh, here we have, you know, 2018, the time when the richest Americans paid the lowest amount of tax uh, in all of history. This is also true in 2019 and, and 2020 so far. How does that happen? This is, this is where it's all going to connect with what happened in big tech. The biggest way this happens is between capital gains and ordinary income. So this chart is a freaking nightmare. I don't know who designed it. It's terrible and awful. You can ignore most of it. It's just, see that big green area that's growing? That's essentially showing you how uh, wealthy Americans, individuals and companies, organizations, corporations, uh, have paid taxes over the last, especially 25 years, right? That essentially they switched the way they made money. They stopped making money as profits and they started making money as capital gains because tax code incentives really do work, right? In tech, this is super important because tech is where a ton of the growth has happened, a ton of that capital gains uh, income has happened. So let's say, Abby, let's say you and I uh, go and invest like $10 million, sorry, go and invest $50,000 um, in, in 2010 into some growing startup. So I don't know where we got the money, but let's just, Maybe Josh gave us a loan. <laughs> just going to assume, I don't know, he's got mafia connections, maybe. He'd like, you know, talk to some guys who uh, deliver, who, what does the mafia run in New York? It's still the uh, tax pick or, uh, or trash pickup, right? Yeah. This is, this is the part of the uh, presentation where Rand digs himself a hole, brought a shovel. Uh, and, and so Abby and I invest 50 grand in this startup 10 years ago. And last month, we, we made uh, $10 million on that. How much taxes did we pay? How much taxes did we pay on the $9.95 million of, uh, of profit that we, that we made on that investment? That's right, $0, not a single penny. Not one dime did we pay on that $9.95 million because of how capital gains uh, works nowadays. So fascinatingly weird and frustrating. 
Uh, funny story, the, the way that uh, venture capital works is that it avoids, it's essentially a big tax dodge uh, asset class. And so it would never actually exist if it wasn't for the capital gains um, tax rate. And, and in fact, even today, even with the uh, only about 5% of venture firms beat the market rate of return, which is, seems weird. It's just that you can't judge which ones that's going to be for a very long time. And so it, it keeps going. These investors, right, the venture capitalists, which, you know, obviously my last company, Moz, raised a ton of venture capital. So I was part of this problem for sure. Uh, investors are not looking for profitable long-lived companies. They build portfolios of one or two winners and 98 losers, right? Essentially all the companies that they're gonna invest in lose money and they hope that one or two are, are unicorns. Unicorns are what they want over everything else because of how uh, this economic system, this taxation system has biased all investors, all wealth, all fund managers of every kind to want growth, not profit, right? So unicorns are the things that everyone is after. And so because of this, you get all of these points of disconnection where you're like, gosh, why is it that all this weird stuff happens? And I think you can build the interconnected map. I certainly have mentally like built the interconnected map from trying, from understanding this point of view. Uh, let, me, let me try and synthesize some of these. So you get things like investor-backed companies spending tons of money for unprofitable growth, which is why when you go to bid on you know, PPC terms, or you go into Google Display, or you go to Instagram or Facebook, you're like, what? How in the world are they paying these rates for these ad spend? How are they spending so much on whatever it is, their PR campaign or their uh, um, SEO campaign? And the answer is, they don't need to be profitable. They need growth, right? And in investors, Right? We know this, are willing to suffer 99 bad investments. They're throwing money at, at investments that they know are going to be bad to find one potential company that might be a monopoly in its space. Because paid acquisition is more provable, it gets to be viewed as more valuable. So for all of those of you who are doing whatever, digital PR and organic and content and email and social, and you're doing it in organic ways, and you're like, gosh, why don't we get the same credit and respect that the paid folks do? It is because paid acquisition is more provable and the platforms try and make it that way because they know that that will earn more organic, more, more investment than organic, right? If I'm a venture capitalist and I see, oh, this business, when they pour another $10,000 into customer acquisition, they get 12,500 out of it. That's way better to me then, oh, this business spent $10,000 on organic SEO, content, PR, whatever, and they get 20,000 out of it. It feels less provable. It's less, I can just pour dollars in and get more dollars out. And so I don't want it. I would much rather have the 10,000 gets out 12,500 than the 10,000 gets 20,000. Weird, but it's true. Uh, big tech, of course, is incentivized to provide perfect tracking as best they can for the parts of paid acquisition that show the returns, but not so much in organic, right? And so of course, big tech also realizes, oh man, you know, we're not getting the growth we used to. So we have to start competing with our own customers in hiding ad data and, and company leadership inside these people, um, inside all of these invested in companies and even the ones that aren't invested in because of how the culture of startups work, they, they try and look for growth over everything else. So you see all of these like disconnected points and you can connect them up to everything that's happening in the market. And so I take these and kind of shrink them down. And I'm like, that's my connectedness model. Like it's the algorithms that govern these platforms and the incentives behind them that rule basically everything else. And so any, any one thing that happens in the market I can basically like, oh, I can synthesize that into my view of the landscape. And this, I mean, maybe it'll need some modification in the years ahead, but it's been pretty stable for a long time now. And I feel like I just couldn't, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see the forest for the trees because I was too far in it. So in order to keep up with big tech's changes, right, to make marketing a competitive advantage, 
I, I want to move us from analysis to synthesis. Like we are proactive in, instead of reactive. We sort of predict, oh yeah, this is where things are going. Here's why. And here's how I can, or my business can, or my goals can end around that or potentially uh, work through that better. So let's dive into this, this algorithms and incentives. And then I'll, I'll do just a couple of tap tactics um, at the end. All right, I mentioned, my heater is uh, going here in Seattle. How, how does big tech dominate? Uh, it, I think it happens really, really simply um, from a technology perspective. It's complicated tech behind the scenes, but essentially this is because the algorithms that govern big tech, almost all of these 25 sites, right, that, that own, you know, 98% uh, of, all, of all traffic in their category, optimize for engagement. Engagement, meaning, um, well, here's an example. This is my uh, Twitter, you know, um, feed, right? What, what Twitter is showing me. And the, the way that it orders things for, not just for me, right? For all of us, anytime you log into Twitter, this is the, the top thing is what Twitter thinks is going to keep you most engaged. And that's the second most likely thing they'll keep you engaged. And that's the third most likely thing they'll keep you engaged. Engaged meaning you'll click it, you'll comment on it, you'll reply, you'll come back to Twitter again later, you'll keep scrolling, you'll stay on the site, right? That's, that's what they, they're, they're trying to do. Behind the scenes of, of Twitter's engagement algorithm, it's machine learning, right? Uh, this is actually, I'll show it in a sec, but this is true for Google too, right? You have these signals. The signal could be, oh, well, people who are similar to Rand engaged with whoever, Andrew or um, Ross or what have you, or Rand in the past has engaged a lot with Andrew. When we showed uh, Rand a, a tweet from um, Ross, it, you know, kept him on the platform before. So whatever the signals are, Twitter's algorithm, engagement algorithm, is trying to find the method of weighting them that best aligns to the ideal outcome, i.e. you staying on the site. And that produces some sort of ranking score, and that's how they decide what to put first, second, third, et cetera. In years past, like I spent my, almost my whole career at Moz basically trying to know and optimize for the inputs. Right, signal A, B, C. That that was like all I cared about. But today, in a machine learning first world, especially a deep learning first world, right, where the where the the engineers aren't even deciding the inputs, it's the machine deciding it. It's really the outcome that I care about, right? And and the outcome that produces the ranking system. So understanding those incentives, the incentives behind the engagement algorithm, that's that's where the money's at. Right. So what, what are they trying to do? They're trying to show me the content that is most likely to earn my continued engagement. They want to prioritize stuff that keeps me on their site, not clicking off to other people's sites. If you've noticed over the past few years that when you share links, they don't do as well as when you don't share links. That's that's pretty obvious. Right. And they want to gather as much user data about you as possible. Right. Because that'll help them improve their ad targeting and optimize their algorithm for the future. Reddit works the same way nowadays. So does Instagram, so does Facebook, so does YouTube and LinkedIn and Google News and, and Google Discover, which are sort of similar platforms at this point, right? Google search uses algorithms that have a really similar incentive, slightly different because of how search works differently from content and social networks. But essentially what Google's doing here when I search for Rice Donabe is provide me the result that Google thinks is most likely to satisfy that search query and put it below some ads, of course, right? But th this is the second most likely, this is the third most likely. It's a lot like the Twitter engagement phenomenon, right? It's just that the satisfy search query is the primary outcome. We don't have to necessarily know all the ranking output in inputs. We just need to know the outcome that the machine learning system is seeking. So you know, what's driving searchers to prefer one result over another result. And when you look at those, it's, it's really similar to what Google sort of uses in their quality rater guidelines or what they talk about as their attempts to optimize for. It's not that Google has a brand score or a relevance score or a visual appeal score or a quality score. Maybe they do, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they do or not because behind it, the scenes, it's a deep learning algorithm 
with, with uh, you know, that is based on training data and it's, it's learning those signals. If you ask a Google engineer, hey, do you use signal X? And they tell you, no, we don't use it. My next question would be, you sure about that? Do you even know? How do you know? Because according to your senior engineers, you use a deep learning system to rank results. And a system like that is built on untrained uh, machine learning, which means neural networks, which means you shouldn't know all the systems, right? All the ranking inputs that are potentially used in your system. You, you can't, it, the machine can't even express them all. So are you sure about that? So in the, right, in the, in the old days, like you would optimize for specific ranking factors, links, keywords, content, and that, that model is not gone, but we're moving toward optimizing for result that best satisfies the searcher's query, which also means earning links because that the, the, the links and the mentions and people talking about you means that more people will know about you, which means they'll prefer you in the search results. But it's not the same thing as like, get a link from wherever I can get a link from. Uh, social media, same story, right? I'm, I'm building engaging posts that earn amplification and keep users on the network versus I'm trying to game the hashtags or game the memes or, or, or game keyword usage. For the content networks like YouTube and Google Discover and Google News and Medium, it's content that keeps people coming back to the platform over and over again, right? And I'm, I'm playing that game way more than I'm playing like the tactical content tricks of, of clickbait or, or salacious visuals, what have you. This is not just true for organic. This is true for advertising too. So here, here's an Instagram ad on the left and, and like a content ad uh, from, I think it's Google's display network on, on the right. And this is not necessarily the highest bidder, right? It's not the person who's paying the most to be seen by me. It's just the ad Google thinks is most likely to succeed, which doesn't necessarily mean clicked on, right? Because Google can track this and say, oh, it's a view through conversion. So as long as Google thinks, predicts that I will eventually buy one of these, let's be real, totally sick uh, Adidas shoes, which you know maybe maybe I will. Someone asked about my shoes earlier. Uh, <laughs> then then they're going to show that to me. And this is not necessarily the most engaging Instagram ad, although I am wearing a Descendant of Thieves shirt right now, so it must have must have worked pretty well. I guess uh, look at that. They figured out that this was the best combination of revenue and continued use of Instagram and personalized behavior for them. For the ad platforms and for you know Google in, in search ads, searcher satisfaction generally beats more raw revenue because they have recognized that they're willing to play the long-term game of satisfying searchers, which keeps us engaged and addicted and coming back versus driving us away by just showing the bidder who's willing to pay the most. All of you who've done any search advertising of any kind, uh, this, is, this is not new information, right? That this advertiser is probably paying the least per click and getting the most clicks, right? And they've done that because, you know, lots of things, right? The, the things like branding go into that and, and organic go into that and click through rate go into that and the, you know, uh, optimization of their ad go into that and their, um, uh, the, the efficacy with which they've built their funnel and all those kinds of things. And these advertisers further down are paying more and getting less traffic. And this is why it's so valuable to have tighter targeting on exactly the people that you want to reach because that gives you greater relevance, which gives you better ad quality scores. And so the more carefully you target, the less you pay per, you know, per traffic and, and conversion. It's a win-win. All right. So let, let's talk a little bit about strategy, knowing all of these incentives behind the scenes and the, the algorithmic inputs um, and, and systems, I think to make your marketing a competitive advantage, it's, it's really kind of three things uh, in 2021. Those are, number one, brand. I, I know this feels like, huh, is he giving this presentation in 1956? Because it feels a little, a little old school. But a brand that people know, like, and trust and prefer over alternatives is just going to win so often. I, I'll show you what I mean. This, uh, <laughs> this is an experience that hopefully I'll get you hungry for dinner too. 
So if you follow me on social channels or Geraldine, my wife, um, you know that I cook a lot, especially, especially in lockdown. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, uh, over uh, last spring and summer, I was like obsessed with making pesto. We went to Liguria and, and visited some friends um, in Genoa. Uh, what was that? 2019, I guess. And I really want to make great pesto. So I go to the Serious Eats article and I'm like, huh, do you see that? You see the, 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 the mortar and pestle there? Like that giant, you know, uh, marble bowl and the, and the stick that he's got. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. It's funny because the next time I visited another post about how to make great pesto, what the heck? It's that same, that same like marble bowl, giant marble bowl and the wooden pestle. Oh, it's, uh, it's made by the prized Baudoni family firm Nuova Marmotecnica in Carrara. Okay, I, huh, that's kind of funny. Like, man, I keep seeing this Nuova Marmotecnica, Nuova Marmotecnica. Here we go. This is uh, me visiting like my 17th article or something on, <laughs> on how to make great pesto. And, oh, with the best Genovese cooks, uh, they all use Nuova Marmotecnica. No kidding. Man, this is, this is, this is weirding me out. All right, I don't know. Fine, what happens? Rand goes to Etsy and spends $220 for a pesto rock and stick. Because, you know what? I'm not spending any money on travel and we're mostly eating in anyway. <laughs> so uh, there you go. $220 spent on pesto rock and stick. By the way, holy crap. It makes delicious pesto, but it is a ton of work. Look how hard I am sweating trying to make pesto with this thing. Like it's this giant... It is so freaking heavy. I, I can't even describe it. It's like, it's like this big, you know, it's as big as my head, um, probably weighs 25 pounds, it's just ludicrous, maybe 20 pounds, but regardless, what happened, right? The Nuova Marmo Tecnica, like, you know, no offense to them, but they, they make great marble <laughs> in Italy. They're not, they're not like marketing geniuses, but they follow this timeless strategy of Right, figuring out who their customers are, finding the messages that resonate with them, uncovering the sources that influence them, which in my case was a whole lot of cooking websites and blogs, especially sort of niche ones that are very focused on Italian food and Genovese pesto in particular, finding where those audiences engage and then amplifying the messages that work in places that they pay attention. And, and basically, if, uh, you know, if you find anything, Nuova Marmo Tecnica does almost none of this marketing themselves. They leave it all to uh, their evangelists and influencers to do for them. It seems to be very effective, right? The firm's been running for 52 years now, and uh, clearly they can get people like me to pay, you know, 10 times as much as the TJ Maxx <laughs> to get, get my machines, right? So essentially... This is not not meant to promote SparkToro intentionally. Just uh, there's not a lot of whole ways to show this, but like if this is my audience, right? People who frequently talk about Italian food or are interested in it, right? These are sources of influence, and I need to find and research and understand those in order to better reach my market and understand the messages that are resonating and the content that they share and the topics that they discuss and the uh, audiences that they do and don't reach. Number two, I, I want to invest in a diversity of marketing channels because if you are overly reliant on one, it will be taken out from under you. The, the last 20 years is just a series of digital marketers investing heavily, oftentimes too heavily in one source and then getting, getting pulled away. So, you know, the way I think about it is, hey, Josh, how much time do I have left? I'll check the chat. It is about about five to 10 minutes, Rand, and then okay. we have some time for Q&A. Great, perfect, wonderful, thank you. Uh, so if, if you're thinking about paid acquisition, like philosophically, the way that I think about it is each incremental ad impression and customer conversion costs dollars. And, and when you try and improve those, it's often counteracted by more competition, right? Uh, rising prices, uh, the, the networks varying the inventory. And whenever Facebook or Google need to show Wall Street more growth, you pay more. Just like last September, right? When, when that CR Interactive piece came out about them pulling away a whole bunch of data so that we wouldn't know how to optimize their spends. 
it's kind of just boulder pushing. And I, I do not love boulder pushing because there's just no gain in efficiency over time. I think really smart brands are diversifying their marketing channels. And this is, this is extraordinary. I don't know if um, like all the years I was at Moz, I wanted a chart like this to show to potential investors, but look at like SEO and social media marketing and, and email marketing and event marketing and paid search. Like they, they are all roughly in this like eight to 10% range because there is a ton of diversity from uh, budgets. It's pretty, pretty extraordinary. Just don't build your digital home on rented land. Like you should invest in all these channels. I invest in all these channels for SparkToro, right? Like I'm doing stuff on Google Discover and, and YouTube and Reddit and LinkedIn and Facebook and et cetera. But it's all to drive people back to my website, my email list, because I can't trust that, you know, whatever the 2% engagement rate that we get on Instagram today is gonna last another year or five years or 10 years. Uh, email opens, they're <laughs> 252 times higher than Facebook page engagement, in, engagement. And that has been true for two decades now. And emails convert, right? So this is, this is why like, if I'm going to build a channel, it's gonna be email. I would take, literally, I will take one email address over 500 Facebook fans, a thousand new Twitter subscribers a thousand new followers on Instagram. I will, I'll take that one email. All right, number three, you want a marketing flywheel that scales with decreasing friction, right? Because flywheels are the thing that create competitive advantage. You, you do a marketing thing, you boost that thing's reach, you engage an audience and hopefully grow it, right? Because then you're improving your algorithmic signals over time, You right? You whatever, boost your ad quality score or get recommended by more platform out, out goes, or you improve your email deliverability score. And so you get next, higher ROI next time you make this investment. And this is really slow to start, especially with new businesses, but it scales over time. And when it scales with decreasing friction, every investment you're making is giving you more power for the future. So, you know, there's a bunch of places you can go and invest organic visibility. This is going to be a dense chart, but you know, there's places like search engines, there's social networks, there's content platforms, uh, influential and niche publications, which is a ton of the marketing that I do through, through digital PR these days, because I, I love those channels. I think they're really underinvested in and word of mouth online, right? So these are all places to get organic visibility. And I think the challenge is choosing which channels and tactics you should use for your business or your clients or your project. And this is how I think about that. Basically, first one is an area of personal passion or interest. I have never in my whole career, I have never met someone, an entrepreneur or a marketer or whatever, an indie builder who's like, oh, I freaking hate Twitter, but I'm really good at getting uh, marketing results from it. This ne that does not happen. Right? So you have to have some personal passion and interest. Second, you've got to be able to provide unique value, value that is different, differentiated from what everyone else in that sphere is doing. Because almost every sector, almost every platform uh, is just inundated with competition these days. And third, finally, an area that reaches the audience that you want to reach and the influencers of that audience. Often, if you can't reach an audience directly, you can reach them through the people who are influential already or the publications that are influential already. This, this intersect, that little golden triangle, that's the ones I'd start with. All right, thank you very much. Looking forward to some Q&A. Uh, really appreciate you spending this um, lovely Wednesday afternoon with me. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, man, yeah. So fired up right now. Also, may have to buy that mortar and pestle like immediately after. Oh this. my god! And the, <laughs> so I also I consider doing this. Um, I also got the rice donabe, like one of those those Japanese ones from Tuaro. Tuaro. I'm not sure how to pronounce it exactly, but it's beautiful. It's clay. It makes incredible rice. It's very heavy and challenging to clean. <laughs> and it's pretty. It's so pretty. Oh my gosh, you're right. It is so pretty, Abby. And I do love that. I, That's all that matters. I'm a sucker.
we saw some a couple people in the chat actually said they had one i think david erickson said he had one like you're not alone in your your obsession for for great pesto here and so oh oh, oh, okay for the for the big mortar and pestle yeah i mean it's just so much work like i i think i made pesto maybe six or seven times over the summer spring and uh i haven't made it since winter because it's just well the basal quality in winter is not so great blah 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 okay so yeah i'm happy to, <laughs> i can answer any questions shoes fashion uh you know cooking <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and or you know uh paid digital marketing sounds Ooh, great so we actually practical. i think we we have a few digital marketing ones um so we'll start with jess Girardi. she asks any takes on Facebook's decision to remove news and now add news back to Australia's Facebook? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those, um, it was very difficult to keep up with the news. It felt like I'm trying to do analysis, analysis, analysis. Like I, I was reading all the articles that popped up on Tech Meme, whatever, two weeks ago, and then last week, and now this week with the change. I, thankfully, it fits really nicely into the synthesis of Facebook is not unwilling to pay um, in places where they feel like they have to, but they don't want to get themselves into a situation where they're um, potentially caving on things that they feel like they could resist um, elsewhere. So like Facebook formed this deal with, uh, what was it? With, with the French news publishers in January, the Australian legislation came through. It was much more draconian. It wasn't great. There was a, I, I shared a great tech dirt article. I'm happy to like go dig up and, and share it here, but um, on analyzing why the Australian law was just broken in a million ways. Um, and, and even for the goals that Australia had, which were reasonable. Anyway, long story short, um, Facebook managed to, I think, do two things that were that are very advantageous to them. One, get Australia to back down, and two, prove to any other country that they are willing to essentially reduce um, news consumption in a country by 70% in a day, right? So like traffic to Australian news websites went, it just, it, it was like 70% gone for a week. And I think Facebook is gonna use that data to be like, now look, you you want to mess with us again, boys? I don't think you want to do that. I don't. Just uh oh, gonna get get myself in trouble with the <laughs> New York trash pickup services again. Thank you. So and that much wasn't unlike that. what happened with Google. I mean, Google News um, uh, had a very similar altercation with publications as well. And so this con- is a constant ebb and flow of of arbitrage and and power over over the content in in news and information and media firehose that that exists between publishers and and then the platforms. Right. I feel like it's yeah. Well, and yeah. you know, I mean, the infuriating thing to look at is essentially when you look at where. Google and Facebook's revenue comes from so much of it is essentially what was previously going to publishers, right? Um, the, like the the ecosystem of published content from 1950 to 2000 or so, you know, employed tons of people and and had all these rich revenues, and that's where advertisers had to spend their dollars and all that kind of stuff. And essentially, Google and Facebook have uh, sort of Trojan horse their way into like, hey, we'll send you a lot of traffic but you have to provide us all this stuff for free. And if you don't, it's a prisoner's dilemma because your competitors almost definitely will. It's tough. It's kind of like kind of like Elon Musk saying, there's a lot of money in cars and energy. <laughs> you know? I mean, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it, it, it really pisses me off. Like, okay, first off, the way he treats women is just abhorrent. But also it really pisses me off when he's like, I'm going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin and then I'm going to tweet about it. You know what you're doing. Yep, it seems like a game. Okay, back to our questions. Sorry, Abby. Oh, not at all. Um, so we've got a lot of them. So Chance Carnahan asks us, asks you, sorry, thoughts on specific paid media landing pages hmm. in regards not focusing on revenue driving content, but engaging, et cetera. Um, uh, let's see, I would say it works well in some sectors for some businesses and works horribly in others. So if you are in... Um, B2B marketing to uh, virology logistics professionals, and you have a bunch of really cool data and analysis of the market and yada, yada, those people are 
totally going to go for that, right? They, they will um, engage with those kinds of pages. If you are trying to reach, I don't know, uh, indie gamers who want to play the next, you know, platformer hit, nope, not, not going to work at all, right? So I, I would just say it, it is a tactic to keep in your toolbox. If you're great at it, it can work really well in some sectors. But this is, this is why understanding the market is so important, right? Like you have to research, okay, are these people influenceable through these channels and tactics? Are, are more of them influenceable by these other ways? Will the people who are willing to share my stuff and help it earn sort of the whatever links and signals that it needs to rank and get engagement from social and get engagement from content platforms, are is that going to work in my sector or not? If you don't have that like understanding of your sector, you'll probably keep, I see this a lot, like you'll keep harping on the same technique using the same hammer and nail um, until it's not working anymore. So just having that um, market knowledge, hugely helpful. Thank you, Rand. We have a question from Madeline Blasberg. Can you tell us more about what you love about digital PR and what tactics slash platforms you lean into? Yes. Okay. Um, so the reason I love digital PR so much is because it is one of the last very underinvested in channels. Um, and when I say digital PR, what I basically mean is um, finding, you know, uh, a podcast that a bunch of your audience listens to and pitching to be a guest there or pitching to sponsor or pitching to do some co-marketing, finding an event in your space that's doing I don't know, a, a digital content series and like pitching to join them, um, finding a YouTube channel that reaches your audience and forming a connection, finding a blog or a journalist or a Substack email newsletter or whatever. Like all of that is like the, the digital PR world. It's kind of classic PR, but for the long tail of publications that are influential in a, in a space. And the reason I think it's so underinvested in is because it is not well understood yet uh, it is still underinvested in because a ton of people invest in it from a purely, I want to get an, a link for SEO way. And those like, those fail. Like it just, you know, the, the, it, it's like one in a thousand or something that, that those will work. And so they just spam, get spammed to high holy heck. Uh, and it's built on relationships um, and exchange of value which is a tough thing to scale. Anything, anytime something is hard to scale and more difficult to prove investment, it tends to be underinvested in by the market and therefore a huge competitive advantage to invest in. That's why I love it. It's, that is how we've built SparkToro. You know, we have like 40,000 people who use SparkToro to, like, to basically find digital PR sources. And the, the way we did that was I built lots of relationships with tons of people who then, you know, and publications and podcasts and YouTube channels and social media sources and press publications and all this stuff. And then like, you know, uh, got covered in those places and that, that drove people to come check us out. So it, I, I can't think of a channel I like more. And it's so good. It's so helpful if you're gonna do digital advertising too because if, if someone already knows you, likes you, trusts you, have heard, has heard of you from someplace they know, like, and trust, when you advertise, your click-through rates are higher, your conversion rates are higher, uh, you're gonna pay less for those ads. It's, you know, it's like brand building for free. I mean, it's work, right? It's elbow grease work, but very effective for small and medium brands. Thanks, Ran. That That's a good segue into Kristen Nottingham's question, which is, should you establish a decent ROAS on one channel before you move on to another one? It seems like you could lose a lot of money if you are trying too many things at once. Ooh, such a tough balance. I, like, So here's the things that are true, right? It is definitely true that if you move on too fast and you don't spend enough time optimizing whatever, your PPC campaigns or your SEO campaigns, your digital PR campaign, your content marketing campaign, you could be losing out big because you just haven't explored and, and sort of tried and failed and learned enough. And also, it could be that you're going to try and fail and learn that that channel just doesn't work, right? Or it doesn't work as well as other channels. So this is why I kind of like that model of like the, the three things, right? Like, are you uniquely valuable in that area? Like, are you, when you advertise in PPC or when you run a Facebook ad or when you run an Instagram ad or when you do digital PR or you do podcast advertising, whatever tactic you're using, 
Are you providing unique value that no one can get anywhere else? Are you personally passionate and interested in it? Because chances are, if you are, you're going to invest more and better than somebody else's. And third, is your audience actually there? Are the influencers of your audience actually there? If they are, and those other two things are true, I'd stick with that channel. If not, I might move away from it a little faster. Awesome. So we have time for a few more questions. We've got like a dozen more. <laughs> okay, um, I'll try and be rap uh, rapid fire. Andrew running in. If you were trying to grow a brand in the beauty industry, what would you do? Influencers seem to be less impactful and the industry very competitive. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, in beauty, I, uh, I have a friend who, full disclosure, uh, does um, marketing, a lot of guerrilla marketing, a lot of paid marketing for Glossier and had a tremendous amount of success there. And um, she, I think she would tell you three things. She would say that um, there are sources of influence that are very powerful. They are difficult to discover and build relationships with, and they tend to have strong requirements because everyone is chasing them. Therefore, it can pay to go into the long tail of sources of influence in beauty niches, especially if you have a very unique product. She would probably also tell you that product uniqueness and serving micro targeted sets, like don't make great foundation, make great foundation for women of Indian descent, right? Don't make great um, lip gloss, make great lip gloss for, this is me spitballing and obviously I don't wear a lot of makeup myself, but um, I, I don't know, goth teenagers, right? Like, like pick, very, very narrow markets and go after them one by one. That will be almost certainly more successful than um, the, the, the bigger angle. Awesome. Okay. We got a question from Tom Pick. Fascinating presentation, but two points seem to conflict. One, the big social platforms don't want to send users off site so there is less organic reach. But two, the priority is to drive traffic back to your site to convert. How do you square that circle? Yes. I like this. Ooh. I'm glad we Ooh. have room for this question. This is good. I love this question so much. If only I had prepared a whole set of slides to answer it in <laughs> advance. What? Yes. Oh. Okay, here we go. <laughs> At the end of my presentation, can you see the screen again? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. All right. So average engagement on these networks is dismal, right? And 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 one of the only ways to beat them uh, is to not settle for average, right? Like you need much higher engagement than, uh, you know, whatever this 0.09%, which is essentially what I'm getting here. So let me urge you to optimize for the engagement streak. I wrote a blog post about this too, which uh, maybe Abby or Josh, you can share in the comments, but the rough idea is you give the network what they want, which is content that keeps people on the platform. So it doesn't have a link a post that either earns a lot of replies or repeat visits and clicks more so than likes and shares, uh, visual video friendly formats, uh, shocking and surprising headlines, that works really well. And you give your followers what they want. So unfortunately or fortunately, you know, for whatever reason, followers really like consistent focus. So yes, I like sharing a lot of things about my whole life and all the things I'm interested in, but most of the people who follow me just want marketing stuff, which is why my marketing stuff does well, the rest doesn't. High controversy content, belief reinforcing content, oh, that it works very, very well. And it tends to earn lots of amplification and following. Easy to consume process, right? Like shorter, more visual, et cetera. So platforms what they want, followers what they want, and then you do this, engage, draw traffic, repeat. So high engagement, non-promotional post. High engagement, non-promotional post. Then a promotion with a call to action and a click and a link. Then, then you go back to, right back to the, the process. These ones in blue, they're designed to earn brand exposure, get you new followers, and convince the algorithm that you are the thing that they should show. And this capitalizes on that algorithmic reputation and sends the clicks back to you. Make sense? Boom. That's a mic drop right there. <laughs> Got you back. <laughs> awesome. So we are at 730, but I did want to share one last question from MinSearch President Carrie. Congrats on the release of your new book. Where's the best place for us to grab a copy for ourselves? Oh, man. I mean, 
if it, if it were up to me, I would tell you to go to indiebound.com, which will uh, reroute you to your most relevant local bookstore. It is also available on Amazon and Audible and, and all those other kinds of you know places. But if you feel like supporting small local bookstores, which which I think are the glue that our communities need, um, then I would urge you to check out IndieBound. They are great. Powell's is also uh, very good, powells.com. Can I also throw one more question in there? Like, Rand, where can people learn more about SparkToro and oh, how sure. can they sign up for like a free trial or something like that? It, does something like that exist? Uh, we don't have a free trial, but we have something even better, um, a forever free account. So you can just sign wow. up. Most of the, all, almost all the 40,000 people who are using SparkToro use it for free entirely. Um, and we love seeing that. I think 57%, 58% of them log in monthly and run multiple reports and get data out. And that's awesome. So yes, you can go to SparkToro, search for your audience, totally free. And then uh, I think when you, when you click search, it'll ask you to register. Once you verify your email, um, you'll be able to run 10 searches a month for free. There's lots of data in there. And it feels like you don't have to ever pay. Just keep using it for free. We don't collect or use that data in some like nefarious way. We just figure eventually, if you find it really valuable, maybe you'll sign up for a month or two. Yeah, I've been one of those lurkers that has been using my 10 searchers uh, per month for free. And then, but I've had a few projects where it's like, okay, I'm totally going to sign up and it'll be like a three month thing. And I'm going to be paying for SparkToro. I'm going to love it. I'm going to, you know, use every ounce of the platform. And it's going to be amazing. Um, so you, uh, you've got so much future LTV to look forward to in me, my friend. Appreciate this it. Is, I, I don't know if you saw today, but like uh, one of our investors, Dharmesh Shah from HubSpot was like, oh, you know, every SaaS company should be focused entirely on retention and keeping every customer for every month. And I'm like, we don't do that at all, man. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry to disappoint, but we're, we're basically like, oh, Abby, you should sign up for a month. You're not using it next month. Don't pay next month. You use it again in three months. Great. Fantastic. You don't use it again for a year. We don't care. Like it's you, you know, come and go as you will. And we're very proactive about being like, Hey, we're about to charge you. Maybe you should cancel. So I, I think that approach is just much more friendly to customers. And I think over five or 10 years, you know, for a long-term company, which we hope to build, I, I think that's going to be better. I hope so. Totally agree. Here. And Rand, if, if we invest together and make $10 million, I am a SparkToro paid customer for life. Just so you know. <laughs> And, and my also, kids and grandkids. <laughs> and also, I think, Abby, if we make those $10 million, we should try and lobby the federal government to raise the capital gains tax rate because it is baloney that you can make $10 million investing and you're already rich. You had to already be rich to make that investment. And then somebody's got to pay get... for this stuff. I agree. <sighs> just, I'm with you, Andrew. It just kills me. It kills. I can't. It's my, it's I benefit mind. from this, but I don't. It does not make any damn sense to me at all. It's just wackadoodle. Completely okay. wackadoodle. Sorry. Rant Good over. Work. Thank you so much for having me, Min Search. Thank you, Abby and Josh, for moderating this. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the great questions. If you have more questions, I am uh, Randfish on Twitter. Happy to answer there. Or Rand at sparktoro.com if you want to email me. Hope to see you in person next year. Thank you so much for joining us, Rand. We're, we're throwing this in the chat, your socials right now. So. Thank you so much. So awesome. Uh, we will see you soon. Have a great night, everybody. Take care.